We need like mobile cameras next year. Mm -hmm. Get an actual camera put back and move with you, Steve Jobs. Go. <laughs> then I'll get a turtle back. And cancer. Yeah. Hi, folks. How was lunch? Yeah. Thank you. I didn't do anything to bring that to you. Um, for those of you who don't know who the hell I am, uh, I'm Justin Kanaki, and I'm one of the co-founders of PodCamp Pittsburgh. So I've been doing this for negative two years now. I moved to Baltimore two years ago, and I let this baby run on its own. And thank you for keeping it alive. It's fun to come back and see what it's grown into. I mean, it's gangly, awkward uh, teen years. Six-ish. I mean, it's like dog years, so it's actually like 23. Um, so today we're going to talk about myths, social media myths. Uh, funny story, by the way, about the uh, title of the... Uh, Session X social media events. I'd send that to Missy as a placeholder. I intended to put a number there. X is just supposed to be like it could be any variable, but instead we're going to talk about as many as we can fit in. So how's that? Uh, and also, there is no need to be uh, looking at the screen behind me because I never make PowerPoints unless somebody forces me to. So we're just going to talk today. You're going to have to listen to me, then I'm going to listen to you, we can listen to each other. We can ignore each other. We can fist fight. My money is on my sword, and if we're playing bets. Uh, so, real quick before I start rolling into this, let me get a. Fine, I can't move. Damn. Let me get an idea. Uh, how many of you are here for the first time ever at a podcast? Okay, here we go. Uh, how many of you are doing social media professionally? How many of you would like to be doing social media professionally if you're not already? And how many of you are just in it for the hell of it? Awesome. Okay. The people here at the end, I like you guys a lot. I love you all, but the guys at the end. The, I got into social media as a content creator. I got into it to create web video and to just sort of play around with the medium and see where it took me. And by figuring out how to both make media and then promote it online, people started paying me to do that for them because they didn't know how to do it. It's good to be an early adopter at times like that. Uh, so I've sort of been grandfathered in as a guy who looks like he knows what he's talking about. Uh, we all sort of look like we know what we're talking about when it comes to social media to those of us who know nothing about social media. If you're brand new, you're always looking for where are the rules? What am I supposed to be doing? How could I potentially be doing it wrong? Which is pretty much everybody's doing it wrong in some way or another. Uh, and what you're always trying to find are what are the metrics that work? I love that word metrics. I'm not even sure it's a real word, but we all use it. Like, what is the data that I can look at and say, this is definitely good for me, and these other choices I'm able to hear, they're definitely bad for me. The problem is we don't usually do that. The problem is we invent myths to explain how social media works. And we do that for the same reason that people invented myths hundreds and thousands of years ago. Something is happening around you, and you don't quite understand how it works. So you're going to make some shit up. And you're going to convince yourself that you understand why this is or is not working, based not on any kind of actual verifiable scientific data, but based on your own learned experiences, and then the idea that there might be someone or something else out there that's pulling the strings for you. Example, once upon a time, when lightning was hitting the ground, we didn't have Doppler radar and meteorologists. So we had people who said, oh, okay, lightning coming from the sky, the gods must be pissed, right? And then to take that one step further, because we're human beings, the gods were pissed at us, probably, right? Like, you don't invent myths, you don't have to do with you. If there's a drought, it's because you've done something wrong and the gods are punishing you. So now we have social media myths in which if something's not working, well, it's, it's, it's broken, and I'm going to invent some sort of farcical reason why it's not working. But I could just use scientific methodology and figure out what is or isn't working for me and how I could be doing things better. Entire industries have been built around social media myths. We call it social media. Uh, let's start at the very top. Let's start with the thing that we should all just throw out of our brains right now. Numbers don't mean shit. There is not one number you can give me that I couldn't spin back to you to mean something other than what you meant it to mean. I'll give you two examples. Um, how many of you have over a thousand Twitter followers? See a couple hands. Do you feel like you're more important because you have over a thousand Twitter followers compared to someone who only has ten? Do you feel less important compared to someone who has a million? 
Because you're looking at those numbers and you're going, man, a million people are following this guy or this girl. They must really be getting something out of it. That must be really important, right? Well, Chicago has more people than Pittsburgh. Is Chicago a better city than Pittsburgh? No. <laughs> Just in the air. All right, very good. However, by the same token, we cannot also say that Chicago is a worse city than Pittsburgh. They are just cities. If you're only looking at population, and population has your only number that you're taking into consideration, you can't tell anything because it's just one variable. You need context to start to understand why these numbers matter. So, I have, I think, 6,000 Twitter followers. Big deal. Because A, I probably don't know who most of those people are. B, they're probably all spam bots anyway. C, if I'm not checking Twitter very often, I never see what they're saying unless they send me an app reply or unless like, they direct message me. So you could be following me and I have no idea who you are, I'm sorry, because I have other things I'm doing. And then D, it really doesn't matter if I have 6,000 followers or 60 if I don't know why I have those followers. So let's start to unravel numbers for a second. Look at your following. You've got numbers. Do you know who these people are? Do you know what you want them to be doing? What action do you want them to take for you? If I tweet something, am I happy that it's retweeted by people? Sure. Am I happier if it's retweeted by more people? Sure. I have an ego. I like to see it stroked. But what's that really doing for me? All it's doing is making me hyperactively refresh my Twitter account to see if anybody else retweeted me. It doesn't mean that I'm actually getting business out of it. It doesn't mean that I'm actually making connections, making friends, making enemies, and learning about myself being proven wrong, all it means is my ego goes boop, 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 all day long, then it drops off, and I think, oh god, I did something wrong. No, social media myth. It just went off somebody's Twitter screen. If you don't know what you want out of your followers, out of your fans, out of your audience, if you don't know why you're doing social media in the first place, it really doesn't matter how many people are following or listening to you, because you don't know why you're talking. You're just making shit and putting it out there, and hoping somebody tells you why it means something to them which can be cool, but it doesn't really make you a creator, it just makes you an experimenter, which is fun. I like experimenters, I do it too. But if you're going to do this for a living, especially, you'd like to know if things are working, if they can be done a little bit better, right? So you start to look at things like metrics, you start to look at things like traffic. I'll give you a, a hands-on example of traffic. Uh, two things. One, I got a front page on Reddit the other day for something that I wrote a year ago. Uh, it got me a number of, like a, like a six times spike in my traffic in one day. Big day. Uh, the reason that doesn't matter is because I'm not putting any ads on my site, so I made no more money than I would have if traffic had come in less or more that day. And B, when information comes in on Reddit or StumbleUpon or these other aggregator sites, I personally have found it does me no good. I get no comments off it. I get nobody else saying anything intelligent or um, rational to me that expands the conversation. But I do see my bounce rate explode. People come to your blog, they look at it for 10 seconds, they're satiated, they're now uh, attention span deficit disoriented, and they click away to something else immediately. So there could be something else more interesting out there. Go, boom, boom, boom. So they came to me from Reddit, they left me from Reddit, I gained nothing. But you could spin that number to an advertiser and go, did you know, on this day, I have 5,000 visitors. They didn't do a damn thing on my site, but I'll leave that part out, right? So you start to look at these numbers and you think, well, do numbers ever mean anything? Sure, they mean what you want them to mean. They mean what you spin them as. I was talking to a client of mine earlier in the year, and he was really upset because, uh, I forget the exact wording of the article, but something came out that said, uh, only 30% of Americans use Twitter. And he read that as, well look, this article is sort of denigrating the whole Twitter social media experience, right? It's casting it as a negative. Why do we care so much if someone's only, like only one in three people is using Twitter? And he said, couldn't you just as easily have spun that to say, do you realize one in three Americans uses Twitter? It's the same number, spun differently, it means what you want it to mean. Uh, let's talk for a couple seconds about influence. You think that because you have a lot of followers, you have a lot of influence. But unless you know what actions your followers are taking, you really don't know if you're influencing anybody at all. Right? Again, if I put something out there and nobody retweets it, was I influencing them in any capacity? I don't know. I can't tell necessarily unless I spend a lot of time hashing through all these metrics. Uh, how many times that bit.ly link was clicked on, how many links from Twitter led more people to my website, what they did when they were there. You could spend your entire day being a CSI analyst for your own data to try to figure out whether or not it's working. That's hard work. If you're doing it for a client, at least they're paying you for it. On your own, you're just throwing shit at the wall and something sticks. And when you start to see things like 
oh, every Tuesday I get a traffic spike. You kid yourself into the myth that Tuesdays are my hot day for traffic. What you're not looking at is what did you post on Tuesday? Who else repeated it? Who else retweeted it? Uh, I get a lot of retweets from about four people who are, I've, I've noticed over the years, end up driving the most traffic to my blog. So when I'm writing something in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, is this something these four people would find interesting enough to repeat? Because if they do, I'll get a nice spike. Will I do anything with it? That's a different story. But uh, so you start to look at your, your work a little more critically. You start to figure out, how is this lining up with my actual goals? And then you start to think to yourself, if I can influence people to take actions, how does this affect my cloud score? Who here knows what their cloud score is? <laughs> Who here cares what their cloud score is? I see many fewer hands. Uh, who here knows what cloud is? Who can explain it? Anybody? In front, Chachi. Uh, cloud uses your Twitter, your tweets to analyze what you're doing with uh, influential about. Cloud analyzes your tweets to decide what you are influential about. How does cloud do that? Cloud won't say. <laughs> They are also, in fact, yes, wrong most of the time, as Chachi points out. So you may have a cloud score of 41. Is that good? Is that better than someone who has a 40? Maybe, but here's the thing. What are those people who are following the guy who's only got a 40, and I say only in quotes, as you should, who's only got a 40, what are his followers actually doing with his media? Right? If I have a cloud score of like 80, and I put stuff out there, and people are like, oh, it's great, and they never actually share it, they're just reading it, that's one thing. If you have a cloud score of 20, they don't only even have 10 followers, but they are rabidly passionate about what you do. Could you not make the argument that you actually have a stronger and more robust fan base than the guy who has a bunch of strangers following him and not really paying attention to him critically? You could. You could also think about something a little bit evil called Facebook Edge Rank. Who here knows what Facebook Edge Rank is? Who here knows what their Facebook Edge Rank is? No one, and you can't, because Facebook won't tell you. But here's what Facebook Edge Rank is. If you have a fan page, Edge Rank is how Facebook decides if your information gets to be seen by other people or not. Because you think you've got a bunch of fans, but what you don't realize is they're not seeing everything you're putting on Facebook. They're seeing what Facebook has decided is important enough to then republish on their page. Now, they just changed that. In fact, I think it was yesterday, they put out lists so you can now better take personal control of the information that you're getting from people. I'm interested to see what this does with EdRank, but clients have come to me often and they say, we want to run sweepstakes. We want to run contests. We want to run these, click here to see more information on our Facebook fan page, because we want to get more numbers, right? Because the more Facebook fans you have, the more valuable your Facebook real estate is. The reason that's bullshit is this. If you put up information on Facebook, on your fan page, and people don't engage with it, and by engage, what Facebook is looking for is them taking an actual action. They are either clicking on that video and playing it, they are liking it, they are commenting on it, they are sharing it. it they, they got off their asses and did something with what you gave them. If nobody does that, over time, Facebook looks at your end rank and they say, oh, nobody really cares what this page is saying or doing. So all of a sudden, instead of all 5,000 of your fans seeing your information, now it starts to slide down because Facebook is finding other things that it thinks is more important for people to be paying attention to. The trick is, if people are reading your updates, but they're not clicking and not doing anything, Facebook doesn't take that into account. So people might love what you're posting. They might love your sweepstakes and so forth. But if they don't actually engage with you beyond that initial click, you'll never see them again and they'll never see you again. And you won't know you're not seeing each other. It's like you broke up and no one told you. It's so, what you have to start doing now, as we debunk that myth, is create media on Facebook that, in a way, encourages or requires your followers to actually engage back with you. Because if you don't, you run the risk of talking to a wall. No one's paying attention to you, but you can tell your boss you've got 100,000 fans, and they don't care because no one's taking any actions. So, this whole mythology around numbers is a little misplaced. Uh, there's also the mythology around monetization. Because everybody who wants to make money at social media thinks, I need a certain number of fans or followers so I can then go to advertisers and say, look, I've got this many subscriptions, like this many views on my video. This is why you should invest in me, right? I know who my demographic is. I can sell them to you. Their eyeballs are yours. I will be their eyeball pimp. Come to me, okay? 
Let me debunk something for you real quick. I do a uh, web sitcom called The Baristas, and we have ads from Blip TV that run in front of our video. Do you know how much money I have made off The Baristas ads since the show launched in January? A, a grand total of less than $150. The show has been viewed thousands upon thousands of times. Less than 150 bucks. If you actually extrapolate it out, for every 100 views I get, we get roughly 50 cents. So if you need 200 to get a dollar, and if you start going up into the thousands and the millions, you realize that even if we, as a web series, had cable TV equivalent numbers, we'd still be making maybe high three figures, maybe low four figures of ad revenues. Now, try to make a TV show that goes on cable and gets millions of viewers for $2,000 an episode. It's not gonna happen. But when you start to see advertisements in front of your web media, you think, they got it made. Look at that. Teaching my Fridays ads. Fuck, how do I get that? <laughs> you don't see that money. Doesn't matter. Doesn't happen. You know who's making money off it, though? God bless them. Blip TV. Because Blip is keeping more than 50-50, in a lot of cases, of those ad revenues that come in. I think that's a genius idea. I think if you're really smart, you don't create media, you create distribution platforms. But I'm a dick, so I decided to go create art instead. <laughs> the other big myth about it, okay, so great, you've got a video show, you have a blog, you have anything you want to put out there on the web. And we were told all along, build it and they will come. But no, they won't. They will not come. They won't come unless you promote the living hell out of it to the extent that people get tired of you. Okay? Uh, they also, when they come through the door, may not stick around. So, give you another example, video based, but this really applies to all media. So you, you know, if you're, if you're an avid blog, you look at your bounce rate very often, and you'll sometimes see that, okay, I have a lot of traffic coming in, then they leave, like the Reddit example. They come in, they read, they go, there's no interaction, it was like a lost opportunity. It was like a blind date that didn't work out. Very often, the same thing happens with video, but you as a viewer don't know this. Because you as a viewer, when you go to YouTube and you see that, oh, this video has like 3 million views, wow, it must be really good. Not necessarily the case, because most viewers of a web video, and I believe the percentage last time I checked it was around 60%, are gone before the first minute of the video is up. And in fact, the first 30 seconds is the biggest drop off. About half of your viewership is gone in the first 20 to 30 seconds of a web video. So you spend all this time and effort for a client or yourself creating this great 10-minute epic of something. And people get through maybe the opening credits and they're like, fuck it, I got something else to do. And you think that you just got a view, right? Because they started watching it, but they didn't finish. So those millions of views you think you've got, you probably only have about 25% of them actually finishing the video. Keep that in mind when you're creating media and front load it so that people actually pay attention in the beginning, rather than you thinking, oh, this is like movies, this is like a novel. I could do like, a, like an eight-page prologue. I could do like a ten-minute lead-up, or I just introduce the character's parents. Like, no, you can't do that. You've got to really introduce the hardcore meat of the story right at the beginning. Otherwise, people are like, oh, look away. Because the web, like I said, nobody pays attention to anything for longer than a few seconds. Uh, all traffic is good traffic? Eh, maybe, maybe not. It depends on what you want that traffic to do for you. But, here's the twist. If you look at your traffic, you can start to figure out what's working for you, whether you realize it or not. You think you're producing media, and you think you're attracting viewers, or readers, or interactors of some kind, because they really like what you're doing across the board. You look at your numbers over the course of a month or a year, and you're like, oh man, July was really good. And you look back at July, have you noticed that maybe only one or two of those blog posts or one or two of those videos were where all your books came from? Or where all your clicks came from? Do you know if that was because one key influencer was responsible for sharing that? Or because the whole world suddenly decided you were awesome on the same day? That probably didn't happen. What you can figure out though is, okay, in my case, for example, I like to use myself, uh, as you can tell. Uh, in my own case, I blogged something totally randomly about uh, how to produce uh, a profitable coffee shop. So I work for coffee shops, I'm a freelancer, I'm in them constantly. And I've noticed a lot about what's positive and negative about them and how they are well run and poorly run. I blogged about that with a freelancer's mentality. I left that on my blog. Talk about coffee shops not at all otherwise. Weirdly, that post drives at least 10% of my traffic per month, if not more, and it's always in my top five. 
So over time, I was like, huh, there's something here. So I did another post about how to do coffee shops from the business end, and I interviewed a few different coffee shop owners. Then I linked those two posts together. So when you come to that first post, it says, by the way, if you want more, click over here. Over time, I realized that those two posts now are in my top five every month. So for some reason, by looking at my Google Analytics and realizing what keywords were leading people to me, I realized that all of my popularity was actually an aberration. It's not from what I do every day. It's from these two or three occasional off-the-wall topics I've brought up that people are desperate about information for, so they keep Googling it. Now, if you are opportunistic, like I am, you will figure out some sort of a way to take these aberrations and make them useful. In my case, uh, when I realized that when I blogged about Kickstarter once, uh, I wrote a blog post called Kickstarter Tips, because I used the crowdfunding source Kickstarter to launch the release post. Again, an aberration. Didn't blog about it again. Always in my top five for traffic. So I created a website called crowdfundinghelp.com, which is all about Kickstarter Tips. And goddamn, it leads people to it every single month. I never would have thought of that if I hadn't started to look at my uh, analytics a little more mathematically, scientifically, and less from the emotional side, and convincing myself that everything I'm doing is wonderful. So I think we have to be a little more critical about what we're doing, what is working, what's not working, and look at it like we're scientists. Correlation is not causation. Just because everybody shows up at your blog on a Wednesday doesn't mean you're really good on Wednesdays. It probably means something else is happening. Find that, and you start to understand what is and isn't working for you. So that's the quasi-prepared part of my preso for you guys today. But I know you all obviously have a lot of questions, a lot of misunderstandings, and I may not be the person to disabuse you of all your notions, but I think if we get a conversation in here going, we can start to figure out from those of us who've been doing this for a while, which is those of you who are just sort of coming into it, and those of us who want to do it for money versus love versus sex. Um, what are your questions? What doesn't seem to be making sense to you? And what have you been told that you can't figure out why it's not working? What's broken for you? Way in the back. And you may have to yell. I just have a question. I understand the whole numbers thing you talked about because it's really all about statistics and how you make them work. Unfortunately, when a marketing person would come and if I wanted to sell advertising on my podcast, they are going to ask for numbers. And me telling them exactly what you just said, kind of like how I feel, doesn't really cut it. They want to say, well, but then you don't have any numbers. You can't show anything. And that's, that's so how I convince the advertisers. Can, can you repeat the question? Yes. So to repeat the question in a nutshell, um, it may be true, as this gentleman was saying, that he knows his numbers may not be all they're cracked up to be. Yet, when a marketer or an advertiser wants to advertise on your podcast or on your blog or on your video, they're going to ask for numbers. They're going to ask what you know about those numbers. They're going to ask about your demographics. And if you're looking at it, you yourself are fairly aware that they're kind of an aberration. You know why it's sometimes held up with, you know, gum and string. Uh, you can't say that to the advertiser because they're going to be like, Psh, screw that, we're going to go over here and put money in something else that's going to tank. So what you've got to figure out is, what does the advertiser want to hear? And then figure out, how can you get that information for them? So, in this case, let's say you're doing a podcast, you know you've got a listenership or a viewership, how can you figure out what that demographic actually is? Have you polled your audience? Have you uh, created a uh, Facebook poll or a SurveyMonkey uh, survey and asked them to go and take it? And I'm saying that hypothetically to you, you don't have to answer that. But what I would suggest is doing something like that, because once you do that, not everybody is going to take that poll. You know, if you have a thousand listeners and you put up a survey that says, tell me all about you, maybe 20 of them will take that survey if you're lucky. But what's cool about it is, those 20 people, that is your core demographic. Those are the ones who actually care enough to want to get off their asses and take an action. It's the Facebook fan page theory all over again, right? And then when you know what those 20 people are saying, you can extrapolate that out and tell your advertisers, look, I know for a fact that my core audience is this, this, and this, right? <laughs> then you can start to create more media that flows in that direction and test it over the course of time. For example, you might talk about three or four different topics. If you find out from the, the survey that only two of them are really resonating with the people who are responding to you, it may occur to you that you should probably boil the focus down to just two topics. Try that for a month or two, and then maybe repost a survey or a question that asks, you know, have you shared this with anyone in the past few months? You know, what is your opinion of the quality of the show as it's happened? And if they start to say, yes, it's going in the right direction, now you know you've zoomed in on the right thing. And if not, man, you fucked up. But the good thing is, you can always go back and fix it. You just take the other two topics instead. You guess wrong, but at least you did it scientifically. Yes. What, uh, sorry. What 
what tool um, do you use or do you think is best for analytics that's out there right now? Uh, well, for, for what specifically? I'm not thinking like Bitly, I just want like recently analytics play it. Where do you go to check all your stats? The problem is right now you sort of go everywhere. Like most people, unfortunately, the question uh, for those of you who didn't hear it was what is the best system or service to use right now for analytics? And where do you want to get the, the most accurate metrics from? Okay. Um, what's that? Oh, sorry. I think I have idea. What's your cloud for? Uh, that's a good question. Can someone tell me what my cloud score is? I've never checked it. But, uh, then, so as far as the analytics, Google Analytics is not a bad place to start, obviously, uh, and it's free. If you really want to start paying for things, uh, HubSpot is not bad, but there is certainly an opportunity cost involved with getting into it. Uh, and they have a lot of bells and whistles that are very specific and will help you drill down very deeply and tell where everything is coming from and what they did once they got there. Um, is it worth it to pay for a paid service at the beginning? I don't think so. I think you can do a lot of it for free. The problem is, as you said, so you can look at Bitly, you can look at your Hootsuite uh, links, which are shortened differently. Uh, you can now look at Twitter as its own metrics, right? The Twitter was starting to, to release information about how well your links have done. So there's going to be a short period here, I think, where people are going to be looking at a variety of different uh, sources of information. And hopefully, people like TechCrunch will be comparing those numbers against each other and figuring out these are the more accurate ones and these are less accurate ones because. Because nobody wants to spend their days looking at 10 different kinds of metrics. But if you're going to boil it down to one or two channels, make sure the one or two that you really can trust that aren't artificially inflating the numbers. Uh, an example, uh, how many of you saw on um, TechCrunch recently, there was the article that uh, Mike Arrington wrote before he left. If you ever quote, compete, or Alexa, in a conversation, you're a moron. Uh, Alexa and Compete are two of the services people tend to look at to see how popular a website is or uh, how much traffic it has over a given amount of time. And apparently their algorithms are so screwed, they are completely unreliable except for broad ballpark topics. Yet we look at them when we're comparing ourselves and we go, oh, well my blog only has this, but according to Alexa, this blog has this doesn't really mean anything because their numbers are not honest. You're better off looking at analytics, you're better off at looking, and the tech project article listed a couple of places that they sort of think are slightly more trustworthy, yet even then they said, there, there's no one service they would say, use and only trust this. If you haven't noticed by this point in the conversation, social media is entirely a shell game. Social media is what you can convince other people it is worth to them. So if you want to sell things, you know, you're in the right industry. Uh, question right here. Is there a difference between someone hitting the like button on a product page on your website as opposed to hitting the like button on your fan page? Do they, which is it one oh, button? As long as they're both using the same Facebook like plugins, nah, it's all, to the best of my knowledge, it's all run for the exact same. And it's the same thing with uh, if you've installed the Facebook comments on your blogs right. as well, too. Yeah, it all goes to the same algorithms. So that's helpful. Of course, what that also means then is Facebook secretly wants to rule your world, right? So if you want Facebook, to take you seriously, you've got to install it everywhere. It's, you know, you're, you're letting Big Brother come into your house and eat your food and sleep with your wife. It's ugly, but we have to do these things sometimes to make money. Uh, other questions? I see other hands for Chachi? Your cloud score is 59. My cloud score is 59. <laughs> I influenced them to do what? <laughs> exactly. Thanks. And I influenced 330 so I don't know. I don't know what that means. Okay, so for those of you who didn't hear this, that's interesting. Uh, for no other reason than to show you that numbers are bullshit. Uh, if my cloud score is 59, according to Chachi, but it says I'm influencing 2,000 people, his cloud score is 51, did you say? Only eight points lower, but it says he's, he's influencing 383 people? 39. 39 people. So there's like a 1,700 person difference between who he's influencing and who I'm influencing. But cloud only sees us as eight points apart. I'd be interested to see, is there somebody other only influencing two people? What are they worth, you know? <laughs> and are they getting gift cards? Because as uh, Bird Baby pointed out to me, uh, Michelle, is she in this room? Um, didn't you get money from Cloud? I, I did. I got $50 from Dick for Dick's Sporting Goods, which is awesome, and for six of deodorant, which I have. <laughs> <laughs> so they're, they're paying you and... <laughs> Okay, see, so that's the other upside to Cloud. Cloud is playing the same game. If you have 
influential in Hugh Hefner. I am influential in Hugh Hefner. Oh, in Hugh Hefner. Okay. <laughs> now, Hugh Hefner has been influential in a lot of people. <laughs> So Michelle, the question we all really want to know, I will ask. But the other question is, what is your cloud score? I don't know. You can share that free stuff with your followers, too. Which would give you... I don't do advertising for people. Right, but if you did, it would improve your cloud score. <laughs> so, other questions? People look good. People already know it all. So, okay, so let me ask you... Oh, oh. Well, let's talk about the monetization of like, uh, something like a um, a cloud score or a cloud an analytical. I mean, that's actually, I mean, that's driving people. I mean, the only reason why she's using it is because she's getting free shit. <laughs> Michelle is the only reason you're using cloud to get free shit. <laughs> or is it because you like the little dopamine rush when you see that your cloud score is up to like 33? I'm sure you're beating me. Go. Ahead. Uh, but I mean, I mean, the, it speaks to a good point that people are starting to use these things and. You know, they're, they're incentivizing me, you, everyone else to, you know, by giving us rewards. I mean, is that a trend that we're going to see that, you know, because everything's bullshit, you know, that they have to give us free stuff for us to believe that, you know, it has value or meaning? Yes. Um, let's put it like this. If, if Clout didn't think you were seeing through them, would they be trying to lure you in with gift cards and deodorant? No. Cloud knows that it's a shell game, and Cloud knows it's invented this algorithm that could be hamsters running in a wheel and spitting out random numbers. But as long as we don't know that, they have to keep getting us to take them seriously. And the, the weird trick is sort of like, um, like group hallucinations. Once we all start believing it, we all buy into it. So as long as Cloud keeps telling us that their numbers are legitimate and we keep parroting that same information, back to our, our uh, clients or to our advertisers, you know, look, Mr. Client, I raised your class score to a 72. Can I get a bonus? You know, th these are the metrics that drive our monetization of an industry that is already on shaky wobbly legs to begin with. So let me throw this question back out to you guys then. What would you actually like to see or know that you can't find out about your numbers? What would make it all seem more legitimate to you? We can't force Cloud to publish their algorithm because then it would be gamed, or they would have to admit there isn't one. Same thing with Facebook edge rank, right? But what are the things that you can't currently find out that you wish you knew a route into? Are you even looking at your numbers? I guess is another good question. How many of you are just like, fuck it, I just blog, whatever, tweet, drinking, I don't care what happens. <laughs> all right, I see a lot of hands. Good, that's an obvious thing. Uh, uh, for those of you who are doing this professionally, though, can I ask, how are any of you tracking it for your customers? Are they even asking for it? We, uh, we give our clients, I work in a marketing agency, we give our clients weekly um, analytics report, but we're pulling separately. I go to Facebook Insights, mm -hmm. and I take a screenshot of the, the thing, I put it in the Word document. Yep. Then I go to Hootsuite, and then I go to Google Analytics, and I, I'm smiling all in one place for the clients, picking what I think is important for them to see and what I think it doesn't mean anything. So, I mean, I feel like there's a lot of legwork in it to just do it. Right. So. Okay, so, so this is interesting. Let's, let's recap here for those of you who didn't hear this. So for her client, she is going to uh, Facebook Insights, and Google Analytics, and whatnot, and pulling all the different uh, metrics that she's able to pull up for the client on a regular basis. Then she is choosing the things that she thinks are the most interesting, the most relevant, discarding the rest of it, and presenting that to the client as a recurring update on how things are going. So already we can see that we ourselves, as the people who are standing between our clients and the numbers, have a sort of editorial pull here. We can decide what we think matters to them, the directions we want to go in. And you can say that's a little dangerous in a way. You could say, well, maybe I'm wrong, or maybe I'm guessing wrong on what uh, the client should be seeing. If you gave them all the numbers, they wouldn't know what to do with them. We wouldn't know what to do with them if we had all the numbers. Most of our clients hire us to work in social media because they don't know how to press publish, right? So you don't want to give them too much information or even peep. So what you want to do is cherry pick the good stuff, disregard the stuff that you don't think is going to be necessary, and base your performance and your success, and in, in a way their success, on your hunches. What do you think is working? What can you legitimately look at and say, well, if nothing else, I know that these three areas we're doing really strongly in. Well, let's keep going with that. Let's keep going with what works. And then you know, like, put 70% of the budget into what we know we can track, and let the other 30% go on play. We'll get lucky out there, maybe. 
but you don't want to spread it too wide and say, we have to know everything, and we have to talk it all out, because you'll never be able to make a decision. We're being like, uh, decision paralysis mode, too much information. Yes? So then, with your series, for example, do you think that there's a real practical way to kind of monetize art at this point using these platforms? Yes. The weird thing about it is, you can, well, you can do it one of two ways. The, the practical way to do it is this. How much money can you make off your art right now if you're doing this for artistic purposes or personal growth? And limit your budget to just that, so you're not pumping your own money into it. You know, if it costs me a thousand dollars to do an episode, and I can only make ten fifty back at ads. That's a dumb business investment on my part, right? If I eventually make it big and I have to repay everybody thousands of dollars and I can't pay them now, I'll just be eventually crawling out of a hole. That's no good. But the other thing that you could do is this: um, figure out what does it cost you to make what you would like to make. So instead of saying, okay, I have to make a show for 50 cents every week, screw it, all right, I'll just, I'll put up a paper cutout of money, and we'll do that every week, right? But what if I said, okay, I could do this show reasonably for $500 a week, okay? What is the viewership that I need to hit to attract the advertisers with specific demographics that they can look at and go, we'd be willing to invest $500 in that? An example that I like to use sometimes is, let's say you're doing a really specific piece of content. Let's say you're talking about fly fishing, which we all do, isn't it? You're doing a fly fishing podcast, and you're like, well, I really want to get a sponsor for this, and I have, you know, a hundred listeners. By and large, no one's going to give you money to appeal to a hundred listeners. But if you know that these hundred listeners are all extremely passionate about fly fishing, and you can tell down to, like, which river or waterway they're going to to take advantage of this, you start to understand, okay, if I could appeal to advertisers that specifically make a certain kind of lure that work in fly fishing, there's a chance they would give me, you know, 500 bucks a year to appeal to these 100 customers every week because over the course of a year, that's 5,200 impressions. Is that worth 500 bucks to them? You know, arguably. So you start to figure out, okay, where is the, the overlap between what I can afford to produce my media for and what I can reasonably talk a potential advertiser into. And the other element of monetization that we don't always think about is screw the advertisers. Here's why. If you don't need advertisers, you don't have to worry about your numbers. What you have to worry about is pleasing your fans. So if you can make money by selling merchandise or by making your media available to them in some sort of a capacity that they're willing to reimburse you for its own production, now you are limited not to what your advertisers think you're worth, but what your fans think you're worth. And I think your fans will always find more value in you than some arbitrary advertiser who just looks at you and says, oh, you are a vehicle, you are an eyeball pimp for 500 people. I don't care what you make. Here's the new menu from Chili's and $20, go away, right? You don't want those people to invest in you. You want your fans to invest in you. That's, that's the artist of me talking. Yes? Uh, can we go one step deeper and get personal? I love deeper. Go ahead. Right. Uh, let's talk about uh, people within the industry and where you established your baseline pricing for Chipotle for you know uh, because there's such a there's a there's an array of companies out here you know it's like all the cool kids are um, and some people charge two hundred bucks a month to do what you do for three thousand dollars a month. True. So, so the question is what? So the question is, uh, I mean, where did you come up with your pricing, you know, for, for your brainstorming services? Or, uh, uh, well, I did two things. One is I fucking made it up, and some people were paying me for it, and they did, so I stuck with it. But the other side of it, to be quite honest, is this. Uh, there's a, if you look it up online, I don't know the URL, but there is a freelance um, rate calculator online that is a great tool. Because what it lets you do is it says, what do you actually spend per year? And you can break it down to an hourly rate. What should you be making per hour in a job? Do you have to pay for everything that you want to do with getting health insurance and whatnot? Once you know what that rate is, what you actually should be getting paid, whether it's your real job, your freelance job, your side job, your you know, prostitution side rate, you know what to start charging. So if you have that number in mind, you look at that and you say, you know what, I could go higher than this. If the industry is competitive enough, I could charge more, but I should never ever charge less than this. And the last thing you could do if you wanted to is what you would do if you're placing ads in a, in a print publication. Call around and see what they're all worth. You know, contact your rivals under the guise of hiring them and say, hey, Jim, I'd like you to consult for me for 30 hours a month. What's it going to cost? And he tells you, and you go, okay. And you hang up and you call your client back and go, here's what it costs. <laughs> Crazy. Three minutes switch, is that it? 
Freelance switch, yes, 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 yes. That's where we go. Freelance switch slash rates. That will help you get control of your life in a way that I could never help you do. I think we're reaching the point where I can wrap this up and we can all go outside and drink the coffee that isn't actually there. So, uh, let's bring this back to the point. Correlation, not causation. If you are looking at your numbers in a vacuum, you're looking at them strictly in comparison to other people, it's not going to help you. If you're jealous of Chris Brogan because he has hundreds of thousands of followers and you've got two, it's okay. Once upon a time, he had two also. He just happened to be really lucky. There's no skill involved. I'm joking. Uh, the other thing is scientific method. Use it. We all learned it in high school and then we forgot it and we got into this industry. Because this industry is where everybody who can't get jobs and anything else goes. Right? This is where you're like, well, I know how to blog. I'm going to convince somebody else to pay me to do it for them. And the fucked up thing is you can. If you're going to do that, if you're going to get into the industry and start doing things because you can, that's awesome. Go for it. You should do whatever you want to. It's a capitalist society. But if you're doing it badly, if you're doing it half-assedly, if you're guessing, if you're artificially inflating rates because you can get away with it, if you're doing things like this, it's going to sort of pollute the entire industry. And then those of us who are trying to make a quasi-ethical living at it are going to have to fight the uphill fight to make it work. And then we're going to have to read a lot of articles on Mashable with things like the best time of day to tweet. There is no best time of day to tweet. I debunked this last year, didn't I? Uh, they published, a, they have an agency that works specifically with brands. And they tracked, for the course of 20 days, I think it was, um, 20 of their brands and figured out, oh, Fashion is really hot on a Tuesday at 10 a.m. If you start telling your clients that based on our calculations, tweeting on a Tuesday at 10 a.m. is guaranteed to get you the most traffic, uh, you are lying through 80 different shades of, of putrid. Don't do that to people, okay? Why were these tweets popular at 10 a.m. on a Tuesday? Is it because of the specific brand? Is it because of the message? Was the message they were sending out a sweepstakes versus a video versus a photograph? None of that was included in this article that Mashable was printing. All they were talking about was time of day. If you're just looking at one variable and saying, let's base our budget or our future on that, you're doing a disservice to everybody, and you're making it even harder for those of us who want to find the real answers to get to them, because we have to sift through all the crap. Thank you for listening to my ramblings. I hope it's encouraged you to take your own work a little bit more seriously or less seriously. And, if nothing else, you now know how to get free deodorant. <laughs>